Morning. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for the people joining online. My name is Michael Miedema. I'm the Director of Cardiovascular Prevention here at MHI. And uh, today we have one of our special grand rounds. This is our fourth annual Kevin Graham lecture. So thanks to our sponsors, Amgen and Angiodynamics for helping out with the lecture today. And you know, Kevin Graham, Dr. Graham had the vision to start a prevention program at MHI in the 1990s. Um, he did that understanding that the best way to treat a heart, heart attack is to not have one in the first place. You know, and at the time, prevention wasn't a very good part of the business model, right? And to this day, we still don't quite know how to reimburse it. And so what Kevin did by starting a prevention program didn't necessarily help MHI's bottom line, but it was the right thing to do. And so we appreciate um, his passion. We appreciate his guts that it took to do that. And so we started this lecture in his honor. Uh, we've had three excellent speakers prior to this that gave great talks, and I'm sure today will be no different. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Sekar Katharazin. Uh, he did the majority of his training at Mass General in Boston. Uh, and then stayed on to be faculty there. He went on to become full professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School through research looking at the implication of genetics on cholesterol and cardiovascular risk. And I think that's what the first part of his talk is going to be about today. The second part of his talk is going to talk about the second part of his career, which is as CEO of Verve Therapeutics, which is a company he started with the mission of providing a one-time single treatment for genetic editing for cardiovascular risk. I know that sounds a little bit science fiction-y, and I think we have a hard time sometimes getting our patients to take a statin, let alone edit their genes. Um, but that being said, this obviously has the potential to be a groundbreaking treatment that could really alter the field of cardiovascular medicine. So I'm really excited to hear his talk. I'm really grateful that he joined us today. Please welcome me in joining Dr. Katharazin. Um, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, at the Kevin Graham um, Prevention Lecture. Um, I ended up uh, le leading preventive cardiology at Mass General Hospital uh, for about a decade um, and really uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Graham's passion uh, for this area. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to uh, share our work um, on um, using uh, genetics to understand risk uh, and then um, uh, uh, moving that forward uh, to potentially developing a therapy um, that would alter risk. Um, so let's jump right in and um, leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, these are my disclosures. So um, here's a patient um, that's motivated uh, a lot of our work, um, a 911 call, 42-year-old um, South Asian male with dizziness and profuse sweating. Um, the, these are the actual ambulance sheets, and what's highlighted is the stretcher was brought into the residence and the patient was get re getting ready for transfer uh, from the chair to the stretcher when he um, started posturing and having a seizure. Uh, the patient was uh, ultimately transported into the ambulance unit, um, and uh, this is the first rhythm here, the third row. Uh, clearly, v VF um, was shocked out of that, uh, had the rhythm strip at the bottom. Um, that shows an IPMI. Uh, the patient was uh, taken to the cath lab, um, had the right coronary artery, the affected artery opened successfully. Unfortunately, had suffered a fair amount of anoxic injury uh, during the resuscitation and died uh, 10 days into the hospital course. Um, so premature MI, uh, fatal. So um, a tragic, um, and the patient had been to the primary, his primary care doctor six months earlier. Uh, and these were the, um, the, the risk factors um, measured at that time. Um, you see the lipid risk factors, the LDL is a little high, the HDL is a little low, the triglycerides are a little high. Um, the non-lipid risk factors um, are, were absent, um, but then on the right there, there's a striking family history. The patient is shown here um, with the little triangle head, um, uh, uh, deceased uh, at, at 42, um, father at an MI at age 54, uh, his paternal uncle also died at 42 of an MI, and his paternal grandmother had uh, a coronary event at age 58. So striking uh, familial aggregation of premature MI. So when we see this, uh, we immediately um, think um, the genome, uh, genetics, uh, could that be playing a role in this family? So if you Think about the population at large and their genome, and then uh, average individual has an average risk for myocardial infarction. But some individuals may carry a genetic factor, that's what's um, shown in the middle there, that may increase risk. 
maybe like in this family. So what's the genetic basis for higher risk? The second uh, question that comes up is maybe that factor actually doesn't increase risk, but maybe uh, protects. So what's the genetic basis for resistance? And then the third question that we worked on is, can we rewrite the genome to reduce risk? So these are the three areas of research um, that I'd like to kind of uh, reveal to you the results in the next few minutes. Okay, first, a little bit of background. So myocardial infarction, of course, is a, is a disease uh, of the coronary arteries, two phases, a chronic phase, uh, several decades, uh, plaque development, um, an acute phase where there's um, in situ thrombosis after plaque rupture, uh, cessation of blood flow, um, and a potential uh, death of myocardial tissue. Um, that's detected by symptoms, EKG change, elevation of cardiac biomarkers. This disease um, is a complex trait, has both heritable and lifestyle components. And for about half of all MIs, uh, the first presentation um, involves sudden death. Now, the best understood risk factors for uh, coronary disease are lipoproteins, schematized here. Um, there are uh, uh, little spherical balls um, that carry lipid um, in the middle. The lipid can either be triglyceride, shown here in blue, and cholester or cholesterol, shown in orange. These little lipid balls have a protein on the surface. Uh, the protein can either be ApoA1 or ApoB. Um, in, and they're named uh, based on the density or the lipids they carry. So HDL, of course, high-density lipoprotein, LDL, li uh, low-density lipoprotein, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, named that way because they mostly carry the blue, the triglycerides. And then there's a, a cousin of LDL called lipoprotein little a, which looks very much like an LDL particle, except attached to the, um, to the, uh, to the ApoB is an ApoA protein as well. So these are the best understood risk factors for coronary disease. Now, um, what's the genetic basis for risk? So we started looking at this question back in 1997 and enrolling patients at Mass General Hospital uh, who were hospitalized uh, with MI um, at a young age. Um, and this is a work that I started uh, enrolling these patients as an intern in 1997. We chose this criteria of men less than 50, women less than 60, because uh, when heart attack occurs at a young age, genetics plays a larger role. So um, over time, we looked at, um, we recruited um, several hundred patients at the hospital. We combined forces with lots of other studies around the world who had similar collections of patients with premature MI, and then systematically compared the DNA sequence of individuals with early MI without, and without, uh, to, to compare understand the, the DNA sequence letters that might increase risk. And what we learned um, are that there are basically two major models of risk for MI. One is the monogenic model, where a single mutation is sufficient to lead to early disease. The second is a so-called polygenic model, where the additive effect of multiple gene variants in aggregate lead to disease. So this is the monogenic model. There are at least five genes where a single mutation in one gene can have a large effect on disease risk. The five genes are shown here, LDL receptor, ABCG5, lipoprotein lipase, ApoA5, and LPA. The second column shows the carrier frequency. So that, that's the fraction of the population that carries a mutation in that gene. The next column shows the blood lipid that's elevated, LDL, triglycerides, or lipoprotein little a. And the last column shows the degree of risk increase as a result of um, carrying the mutation. So these are the five genes. And the one I want to highlight is the top row, LDL receptor. About one in 250 people in the United States and actually worldwide carries a mutation in this gene. And as a result of carrying the mutation, they have LDL typically over 200, um, sometimes over you know, lower levels like 160 or so. And um, if they carry a mutation that raises their LDL, those, those individuals um, uh, are about a fourfold increased risk for heart attack and compared to those who, who don't carry a mutation. This disease, of course, is called familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, what we've learned from this, the monogenic model 
is that high cumulative exposure to LDL cholesterol is a root cause of MI, a root cause of atherosclerosis. And that's what's depicted here on this slide. On the x-axis is age. On the y-axis is cumulative exposure to cholesterol. Uh, the, the, the amount of cholesterol the arteries see in aggregate. And what you can see is there's a threshold up at the top, a gray bar. And when you cross that threshold is when you get clinical events. So the average person shown in this black line crosses that threshold at about 67. That's the average age of a first MI in the United States. But individuals with FH, those genetic mutations that raise the LDL lifelong, they uh, reach that threshold earlier. That's the purple line, maybe in the 30s and 40s, like this patient that we just, just saw. So um, this is really one of the key um, insights from this genetics work. Okay, now if you take 100 patients with early MI, in what fraction can you find a mutation in one of these, um, uh, these monogenic genes? And the answer is about two, uh, two out of 100, so 2%. Uh, these individuals, as I said, is about fourfold increased risk, and this was a, a recent study that we, we uh, published. Now, um, what about everybody else? Why are they having a heart attack at a young age? Well, one of the uh, possibilities is that it's actually the polygenic model. And here, um, this is work um, uh, that we did over about a decade where we looked at um, individuals with disease, without disease, compared their sequence at, at the polymorphism level. So this, these are DNA polymorphisms. These are single spelling differences between people. And there are millions of places that uh, two individuals might differ in the genome. We looked at these across the genome and asked how many spots turn up in terms of risk. And, um, uh, and this analysis, again, is comparing cases and controls. And what we were able to gather is there's actually many, many sites that contribute to risk, that could contribute to risk. And you can sum them all up into a score, a so-called polygenic score. So this is a polygenic score comprised of now about 6.6 .6 million common DNA polymorphisms. And the score when plotted uh, for each person, it's calculated for each person and then plotted across 300,000 people here in this graph, it ends up being a beautiful bell curve. Like many other quantitative risk factors for heart attack, like cholesterol or blood pressure, if you plotted the blood pressure in 300,000 people, you, this is what you'd get. So what we have here is a new quantitative risk factor for MI. It's a single number that distills the genetic risk that comes from all the DNA polymorphisms across the genome. And um, the question then becomes, if you're high on this number, uh, maybe on the right tail of this distribution, how much higher risk are you? And are you potentially at risk for early onset myocardial infarction? So we labeled the top 5% of the distribution as high uh, polygenic risk. This would be like labeling people with the cholesterol over 190 as high risk, okay? So that's the equivalent here. So we labeled these high polygenic score individuals and then asked what fraction of them are represented among the early MI patients. And the answer is about 17%. So this is a, was a striking result for us. And, and they have about a fourfold increased risk. So this polygenic model probably contributes a much greater degree to early MI than the, even the monogenic model. And um, this is something right now that's not being tested for in clinical practice, right? There's not a clinically available, until very recently, there was not a clinically available test. So this is a, a very important opportunity for prevention, where if you identify these individuals, um, may be able to help them. And then, so the natural question is, okay, if you identify somebody as high polygenic risk, can you do something about that risk? Or is DNA destiny? Well, it turns out that we and others have shown, yes, you can modify that inherited risk and you can modify it by the things that, that Kevin Graham you know, talked about, which is lifestyle, and LDL lowering. So DNA is not destiny here, that polygenic risk can be modified by those prevention interventions. 
And we can talk a bit more about that during the question and answer session. Okay, so that's the um, monogenic and polygenic model for risk. Let's move to resistance. Now, um, a DNA, as I said, a DNA mutation may lower risk for disease. Why might we want to know about that? Well, the major reason is they, the resistance mutation can guide the development of new medicines. And the best example of that is in the LDL story. So we all know in the epidemiology, higher level of LDL is correlated with increased risk for myocardial infarction. Well, it was discovered uh, about a decade plus that there are individuals who carry a mutation in a few different genes. The first one identified was PCSK9, where the mutation turns off the gene. These individuals have lifelong low levels of blood LDL cholesterol. In this case, in one case, a 14 milligram deciliter, that's that level lifelong. These individuals are healthy and are resistant to heart attack. So, what, is, what does this mean? Well, it means that if you could develop a medicine that mimics that mutation, that would, my medicine would, would be helpful to lower LDL and lower risk of MI. That's exactly what happened. A few different companies, actually Amgen being one of them, as well as um, Regeneron and uh, now Novartis ha have developed therapies that target PCSK9. These medicines lower LDL. And in the case of praluent rapatha, they've been shown to reduce risk of coronary events as well. So this is a great example of moving from genetics to uh, medicines and the, the resistance mutations inspiring the development of new medicines. And this is also an example of, um, uh, of a resistance pathway for, L, uh, for MI, and that's low LDL, having LDL low lifelong. If one's LDL is really low lifelong, it's very hard to develop an MI. Okay, are there other genes beyond PCSK9 where these resistance mutations reside? And the answer is yes. There's seven more, so a total of eight. Shown here are the eight genes, the first row, then the fraction of the population that carries the mutation that lowers risk, the blood lipid that's lowered lifelong as a result of having the mutation. So you can see it's either LDL, triglycerides or lipoprotein little a. The, uh, the degree of protection conferred by the mutation, sometimes quite remarkable, so near complete protection in some cases. And then lastly, where the medicines development stands. So you can see for all these different targets, there are either medicines already available or in development. Okay, let me move to the last portion, which is really thinking about leveraging some of this information to develop a new medicine. So back in 2016, um, the American Heart Association um, put out a call for investigators um, to propose their best ideas to cure coronary heart disease. This grant competition was called One Brave Idea. They were actually gonna grant $75 million to one grantee um, for this project. So I was a, a, a professor at HM Harvard Medical School at the time and National Hospital and uh, put forward an idea that leveraged these genetic insights. There are two major insights from the human genetics research that we and others did. One is if one's LDL is low lifelong, it's really hard to develop an MI. Second, there are a series of disease causing genes, those eight that I mentioned, that are naturally turned off in humans and lead to resistance to MI. So the idea we put forward uh, is here. Imagine if there was a single course treatment, a one-time treatment that durably and safely lowered blood LDL cholesterol. The human genetics research taught us that such a medicine would have the potential to treat and ultimately prevent myocardial infarction altogether. Okay, so this was the concept and Dr. Braunwald recently um, summarized this in, 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 a, in, a, in a thought piece um, that's titled, How to Live to 100 Before Developing Clinical Coronary Artery Disease, a suggestion. And his suggestion was to get the LDL as low as possible for as long as possible. Get the LDL as low as possible for
for as long as possible. The human genetics and the clinical trials over the years has really revealed this is a key answer to coronary disease. Okay, now, can we make this happen, this one-time treatment and permanent lowering, permanent and safe lowering of LDL? Well, can, and that, what, what would we be able to do if we had such a medicine? Well, we could transform the care of myocardial infarction from daily pills, intermittent injections to truly a once and done. That was the idea. Can we do this? Okay. Now, there were, uh, uh, right around the time we, um, right before the time we proposed this idea, there were some new technologies that came about that offered the possibility of rewriting the genome very precisely, okay? And there are two technologies here that are shown that could do that, that could basically permanently turn off a gene like PCSK9 or another one of these disease-causing genes called ANGPTL3, turn it off in the liver. One technology is called CRISPR-Cas9, that's shown on the left. Another technology is called base editing, that's shown on the right. CRISPR-Cas9, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. It's basically like a molecular scissors. It go, you can direct it to go to a very specific spot in the genome by providing a small kind of like a GPS localization signal. Once it gets to that spot in the genome, it cuts and can turn off a gene that way. On the right, the base editing is kind of a cousin of CRISPR-Cas9 kind of a CRISPR 2.0 approach, where instead of cutting DNA, this is more like a pencil and eraser. Again, you guide it to a very specific location in the DNA, in the genome, and then at that spot, it can change, chemically convert one letter, like an adenine, an A, to another like letter, like a G, a guanine. So we got access to both these technologies and tested the ability of these technologies to turn off the PCSK9 gene in the liver, in initially in, in liver cells, and then in mice, and then ultimately in non-human primates, monkeys. The drug that we developed, um, we started uh, Verve Therapeutics in 2018. Oh, I should go back to that story about the American heart. So we proposed this, um, this concept uh, of, of one and done for coronary disease, um, and we didn't end up winning that competition uh, in 2016. But over a couple of years, from 2016 to 2018, uh, we uh, uh, incubated this, this company to, to develop this idea. And then in 2018, launched Verve Therapeutics. And Verve's goal was to develop this one and done treatment. And what we've done is develop this drug product, um, which looks like this. It's a little circular um, a lipid ball in the center of the lipid ball is um, the mRNA for the editor, the base editor, and then a guide RNA that directs the editor where to go in the genome. So there are essentially two nucleic acids that are packaged in this little phospholipid monolayer. And um, the electron micrograph of the drug product is shown on the right. It's a little ball with the nu nucleic acids in the middle. What this... Um, drug does, it's delivered intravenously with a one-time infusion over 60 minutes. So peripheral IV, intravenous infusion, it goes to the liver and then makes that single spelling change at one spot. And the spot that we've directed it to is um, um, the, the PCSK9 DNA sequence at the end of exon one. And the intended consequence of that A to G change is to turn off the gene. That's what's shown here. So the goal is a single course gene editing medicine to durably lower LDL and treat ASCVD. The one X on the left refers to it, the fact that it's a one-time intravenous. The second panel shows what happens after you deliver the drug intravenously. The drug is taken up by liver cells, each liver cell through a receptor. The content, once inside the liver cell, the contents are released into the cytoplasm. That's the little squiggles here, the mRNA and the guide RNA. The mRNA is translated to protein, what's called adenine base editor protein or ADE protein. That protein binds to the guide and then that complex makes its way from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. And then believe it or not, this little molecular machine will scan 
every chromosome, chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, and for a set of letters in that guide, 20 letters. And we've directed those 20 letters, of course, to be in the PCSK9 gene. So it'll keep scanning until it finds that perfect match to the 20 letters. And then it sits there and then makes that one spelling change, an A to a G at the directed spot. In our case, you know, in the PCSK9 gene at the end of exon one. The, that spelling change that's made in the liver cell shuts off the PCSK9 gene from producing any protein. And the consequence is the blood protein level goes down dramatically. And then um, the, the consequence of that is, of course, the LDL level would go down. So this is the theory. You know, when we started in 2018, this was all just a concept, actually. There, it had not really been shown to work in mice or in monkeys. And what I'm going to show you is the data that we've generated um, testing this adenine base editing approach um, in non-human primates, in, in monkeys. So this work was published last year in the journal Nature, in vivo CRISPR base editing of PCSK9 durably lowers cholesterol in primates. So the experiment done was an intravenous infusion uh, into two groups of monkeys, a treatment group at the top, a control group at the bottom, and um, the monkeys um, got measurements made before treatment and then serially after. Um, now the, the, there's been follow-up of the animals to two years. There are three measurements that have been made over time. One is we look directly at the DNA in the liver with a liver biopsy and um, ask, are we making that spelling change? We do that by sequencing the DNA. The second is the protein, blood protein level, PCS can protein level can be measured before and after to see how much of the gene we've turned off and how much the level goes down. And then of course, the key clinical factor is the LDL. Does the LDL go down? We've measured that before and after as well. Okay, so we've done that in the two groups of monkeys. So let me walk you through the results. So shown here first is the level of editing we're getting in the DNA. Well, we're, to orient you, on the x-axis are the control monkeys and the treated monkeys. The control in blue, the treated in purple, each bar represents a monkey. On the y-axis is the level of editing we're seeing at that one letter that we want to make the change, the A to G change. We're getting about 70%, 67% DNA editing in the treated animals. And then in the control group, we're not getting any, any editing as, as expected. Okay, so this is good. We got a lot of the cells that have the A to G change. So what happens to the protein level as a result? Well, the protein level, the blood PCS canine protein level went down by about 90%. The blood LDL level went down by about 60%. This, these are at two weeks after that one-time intravenous infusion. Okay, so that's good. Um, so we've turned off the gene and the blood LDL goes down. Um, at two weeks. So what happens over time? Because the concept here was a one and done. Well, this is the data two years later. This is actually 15 months. The data look very similar in two years. On the x-axis is days post-infusion. On the y-axis is the PCSK9 level. And what you can see is that um, the 90% reduction seen at two weeks remains at 90% out to here 15 months. The LDL pattern is very similar. 60% lower at two weeks, 60% lower at 15 months. This experiment in four animals, uh, treated animals, has been repeated now multiple times by the group in much larger studies and, and, and the patterns are very similar and the degree of effect is very similar, about 60% reduction in LDL cholesterol that is durable for two years after treatment, two plus years after treatment. Okay. So it works. Um, what do we have here? Well, we have a molecular surgery be able to make a single spelling change in the DNA in the living animal and nearly every liver cell. Okay. And earlier, Mike mentioned that you know we, we often have our patients, you know, difficulty taking daily pills, but in clinical medicine, we're actually very used to one-time interventions. 
that can permanently change for health. I mean, think a stent or think cabbage. So this is really surgery without a scalpel, a one-time treatment with a dur potentially a durable health benefit. So on the x-axis um, is different chromosomal locations. On the y-axis is the level of editing here in this graph, looking at a, a slightly different thing. Um, I'm sure many of you are wondering, okay, there's great on-target editing. So the A to G spelling change in the DNA, the PCS canine gene, but is there any off-target editing? Are you making any spelling changes anywhere else in the genome? And that's what's um, depicted here, um, an analysis of that. So we're taking primary human liver cells, treating them with drug. The drug is called VERV 101. This is the drug uh, um, uh, targeting PCSK9. And we're looking to see whether well, there's on-target editing at the PCSK9 gene, but then is there any off-target editing at any of 3,000 potential off-target sites? That's what's shown on the x-axis. What you can see is there's excellent on-target editing. That's the purple dot. But any of the 3,000 plus potential off-target sites, there's no, there's no editing. It's all centered around zero. So this suggests that the drug product is very specific. You make a spelling change at the intended spot, but nowhere else that we can detect. So um, this level of specificity is a function of the editor and the guide that we 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 put together, and it was a fair amount of work to screen for the specific guide that would give you this level of specificity, the guide RNA. Okay. Now, where are we with, with this medicine? Where are we in the testing? I mentioned we have the tests in non-human primates, and we're right now in a phase one study testing in humans. This is the pipeline. We have the first product targeting PCSK9. The initial indications are shown there. The second product targets a gene called ANGPTL3, and turning this gene off will lower not only LDL, but also triglycerides. This is another one of those genes that's disease-causing, and in humans, there have been resistance mutations identified. Now, um, from getting back to the VERB 101 targeting PCSK9, um, we dosed our first human with this investigational in vivo base editing medicine in July. Uh, and this is being uh, evaluated as a potential treatment for heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, abbreviated here HEFH. Those are the individuals with the LDLR mutations that I mentioned earlier. Now, we will be dosing patients um, uh, uh, this year into next year and expect to have clinical data for this program um, in 2023. Here is the clinical trial. It's a phase one trial, heart one clinical trial. And uh, it's about 40 patients with heterozygous FH. That means they have a documented LDLR gene mutation. They have documented atherosclerosis. So they've actually already, already had a clinical event. And on oral standard of care, they have an LDL over 100. So this is a genetic subset of early coronary disease, the monogenic subset. In these genetic patients, we are looking to identify about 12 of them for the part A. There'll be th four different dose groups. Each dose group is three patients and we'll escalate up doses to identify the dose that will have efficacy and safety. And then we expand in a part B into a larger group of patients at that selected dose. This is a trial roughly one year and then there's long-term follow-up as well. And the major endpoints are safety, it's a phase one trial, but also we'll be able to get a read out of the blood PCSK9 level and the blood LDL level, very similar to the studies I showed you in the monkey model. So this study is ongoing, as I said, we'll have clinical data in 2023, next year. Now, how do we plan to develop such a, this medicine? Um, well, we have the phase one study that's ongoing. That's the circle all the way at the top right. We expect to expand to a phase two in also in the genetic disease, heterozygous FH, and then close out with a phase three, a pivotal phase three in HEFH. HEFH is a you know, relatively common genetic disease. I mentioned 
the prevalence is about one in 250. That means there's about a million people in the United States with this problem, about 2 million in the EU and UK, and about 31 million worldwide. So our medicine could be a genetic treatment for that genetic disease. Now, if this works and it's safe and it's tolerated, you could imagine this could be a treatment for atherosclerosis in general, at, at garden variety ASCBD patients, where we anticipate doing a pivotal phase three in that group as well. And then ultimately, again, assuming a safety database and a long-term follow-up holds, this could be a preventive medicine. So get to a patient prior to them having an event, get their LDL as low as possible for as long as possible. Okay, here's the current model for how we treat ASCBD. It's the chronic care model. Shown here is a hypothetical patient with HEFH. On the x-axis is age, on the y-axis is LDL cholesterol. What you can see here is the patient has an LDL of about 200 and uh, often unrecognized, right, in these HEFH patients. And then they have an MI at age 44 here. The patient gets put on standard of care, lifestyle plus statin, LDL comes down, maybe not enough. Then there's a monoclonal antibody for PCSK9 added. LDL comes down even more. But in many, in many patients, in fact, a large fraction of patients, it doesn't stay down. There is an oscillation in the LDL over the life course because of issues like adherence, access, healthcare infrastructure needs, and the consequence of that oscillation in the LDL, the poor control of LDL, is of course recurrent events that are depicted at the top, a stent, bypass surgery, maybe even death. So what we are looking to do is replace this picture with this picture, a one-time therapy that leads to dramatic and durable LDL lowering in a safe way. If we could accomplish this, we think we can solve many of the challenges right now associated with the chronic care model for patients with ASCBD. Thank you. Thank you, that was uh, fantastic. Um, very revolutionary treatment. We have time for questions. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, waking us all up at 7 a.m. out here in Minneapolis. That was a great talk. Um, can I just ask a basic question? How did you decide on which nucleotide to change in the PCSK9 gene? That's a great question. Um, so the intended edit here, right, the intended goal here is to turn off the gene, right? And with, the, with that single spelling change. And there are a few different ways that one could turn off a gene by making a single spelling change. One is to create a stop codon. Uh, another is what we did, which is to disrupt a splice site. Um, as you know, the genes basically have a structure to them. There's exons and introns. The introns are the intervening sequences that are spliced out um, uh, from in the mRNA before the mRNA is translated to protein. That splicing occurs at the junction of the exon to intron at a splice site, it's called a canonical splice site. It's just two letters that basically direct where to splice. What we've done is change one of those two letters at the end of the first exon. So what happens is then the splicing doesn't happen and then the gene basically stops. Um, and so the, there's no uh, mRNA that's made that stays around in the cell. So we had to look at the we had to look at the gene sequence and and figure out, okay, where are all the different spots in this sequence that we could change that could um, basically lead to the turning off the gene. And then we evaluated each of those spots. That's that screening that I mentioned, uh, not only for the ability the efficacy, uh, but also the safety, like because you want to be able to turn off 
but also not have any of the off-target effects, right? And so that it's that screening that we did to basically get to this spot. I had a question. Uh, any other concerns for safety other than off-target editing? It's a great question. Yeah. So um, there are two major safety um, um, items. Uh, one is the off-target, and we can talk more about that as well. But the other is there, with the acute infusion. So during that 60-minute infusion, you're giving the patient a lipid load, actually, because it's, this is a lipid nanoparticle. See the, this here? So the, the, the delivery vehicle here is a lipid nanoparticle. So the nucleic acids are packaged in a lipid nanoparticle. And um, that lipid load can lead to a transient rise in L liver function tests. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's a predictable effect of LNP infusion. And, um, but it's a transient rise. It goes up a little bit, comes back down within a, a few days. Uh, and it's a one-time treatment here, right? So it should be manageable. But those are the two major um, adverse events that we're looking for. By the way, on a side note, what you can see here is that you know, this is the format we had decided for our drug back in 2018. Um, and, uh, but then COVID came along in 2020 and really, you know, you could, this, is, this is what a COVID vaccine looks like, right? Yeah. COVID vaccine is an mRNA, it doesn't have the guide RNA, mRNA package and lipid nanoparticle. So it's a kind of a coincidence that that was the technology that ended up working for COVID uh, but our drug looks very much like a COVID vaccine. And so this is going to have some potential knock-on benefits for us, particularly when we manufacture this, uh, because now the manufacturing capacity is, is plentiful for this kind of medicine. And the costs are actually very manageable, uh, particularly when you make it at scale. Well, maybe uh, just to answer my question, but is this technology being utilized in other disease states successfully? Um, it's, it's, you know, so the, the, this, this technology of base editing um, was invented in 2017. So um, th there are, uh, 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 and it was put into a company called Beam Therapeutics uh, that is, uh, has the exclusive um, use of this base editing technology. We've licensed um, from them this technology for our uses, the, our genes. Um, so we're the first to take it to patients for in vivo liver. Um, and then Beam Therapeutics is taking it to patients uh, for sickle cell disease. Are all my questions? Hi, uh, yes, we have several online questions. Uh, the first of which comes from Dr. Hauser, who asked, do you anticipate treating young patients? Um, I think ultimately, um, yes, um, uh, but initially we'll be treating adults who can give consent um, to the procedure. Um, this, um, you know, the, the indications that we're pursuing, you can see here um, uh, for the first program, it's heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, the genetic disease, and then the um, ASCBD, uh, not an LDL goal on oral therapy is the second indication. The heterozygous FH patients, typically, you know, the MI is in the 30s, 40s. Um, so that's, these are patients with ASCVD. So that's the age group that the first product will be focused on. The second product you can see here is starting with the genetic disease of homozygous familiar hypercholesterolemia. These are patients who have LDLs of 500, 600, 1,000 even. And as you know, the, these are younger patients typically that when they present, um, often very young, uh, less than 18. So it's possible that we'll be ultimately looking to do younger patients in that group as well. But I think the, the larger, you know, kind of gen, general question that we get asked is, you know, our general, our, our development path here starts with patients who've already have established disease, but wouldn't it be better to, to really lower the LDL prior to an event? And I think that is where we ultimately would like to go, this outer ring of the bullseye. Uh, uh, but uh, you can imagine that to get there, we would we would need we would want to have a, a good safety database um, before treating uh, patients for primary prevention. Thank you very much for that. So we also have a a question that comes from Dr. Bradley, who asks: uh, Given the permanence of the therapy, have you considered, or has there been consideration of development of a reverse treatment, i.e., surgical cure, uh, to address potential off-target editing if that were to occur? Um, I think that's an, it's a, a, a concept that uh, we get asked about. 
And I think that the, the uh, there's two aspects to this idea of reversal. One is, you know, do you want to change the, the PCSK9 spelling change that you made? And then the second is, you know, for, uh, you know, for any off target. Um, and for both of those, the short answer is no, we're not really looking to develop reversal agents. First, the PCSK9 on target um, a change, um, well, there, you know, the, the PCSK9 um, inactivation, uh, either by medicines or naturally with the gene mutations, uh, there are a bunch of people walking around who lack the gene either in 50% or completely 100% and they're healthy. So this gene, you know, surprisingly, um, you know, looks like a spare part. Um, it can basically be safely gotten rid of and, you know, and all you get is health. Um, so, so then on the, on the off target, I think what people worry about in terms of off target is, um, you know, you, you're making a spelling change somewhere else, you know, and then, um, you know, for us, remember the off target change would be just an A to G spelling change somewhere in the genome. Now, odds are that's going to be benign because it, it, it's not going to be in a gene. It's not going to be in a, um, uh, it's most likely going to be an intervening sequence. Uh, but even if it was in a gene, most often the A to G change doesn't have any consequence. What you worry about is the, it's in a gene, but it's in a cancer causing gene. And that very specific A to G change you made, you know, leads to proliferation of the cell. Um, and if that happened, you know, and we're checking to, you know, really, make sure that we don't have any of the such changes. But if it does happen, um, you know, uh, the treatment would not be not, you know, trying to reverse that spelling change, but actually treating the cancer. Um, so it would really, um, so, th so, th so, th so that's, that's really the approach to any potential off target. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So back to the subject of mRNA treatment. Uh, if multiple mRNA vaccines are combined with other mRNA vaccines a patient may have, uh, can this gene editing combined with other mRNA treatments to potentially modify beyond the original design? That's a great question. So I think what you're asking about is multiplex editing. So the idea, can you actually edit a couple of genes with one, one, one treatment? And we've looked at this. Um, so, you know, we have two products here, right? So one is um, uh, targets PCSK9, the other targets NGPTL3. Um, and we looked at a couple of different permutations. One is we initially started with a one-time infusion with VERB 101. And then 30 days later, came in with the second program, second product. And what we saw was that with the, when you infuse in verb 101, the blood LDL comes down. And then the second product, um, the blood and the blood PCSK9 comes down. Then 30 days later, you give the second product, you get the other gene turned off, NGPTL3 turned off, and the blood NGPTL3 level comes down dramatically. So that's kind of sequential editing, one product after another. And then we developed a, a medicine where an experiment where you have inside one lipid nanoparticle, you have the mRNA, but then you have two guides, one targeting PCSK9 and one targeting ANGPTL3. So, and then you infuse in that product and you are simultaneously able to edit both genes at the same, with the same infusion. So after that infusion, both the PCSK9 blood protein and the ANGPTL3 blood protein come down dramatically. So yes, so in the future, you could imagine that a couple of different genes are edited in the, um, at, at, with a single, single mm -hmm. treatment. Um, so right now, you know, it looks like anything you want to change in the liver, it's going to be possible. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, thank you so much for that. So there are a few questions in the Q&A pod uh, regarding FDA approval. Uh, so do you think there might be a chance of not getting FDA approval for phase one studies? And a follow-up question would be, would you be able to provide an update on enrollment for VERV 101 at some point? Yeah, so, um, so we've gotten regulatory clearances in two countries, um, UK and New Zealand. We've had a global regulatory strategy for phase one. 
remember phase one study is to test the initial safety of a medicine. Um, and, uh, and ours is a brand new medicine, right? This is a new treatment modality. So, you know, there are different treatment modalities, pills, monoclonal antibodies, siRNA now, and this, le this kind of gene editing is entirely new. So, uh, so phase one studies are really important. So the third country we're going to do it, we, we are, um, the global, the regulatory strategy involves, of course, is the U.S. So we have guided as a company to having the U.S. IND, the Investigational New Drug Application uh, Clearance, uh, by the end of this year. So we anticipate clearance by the end of this year in the U.S. And so um, ultimately, the phase one study will enroll patients in all three countries. Uh, as I said, the 12 patients is the goal for the Part A, and we expect to have clinical data uh, next year. Um, and, uh, and, and we really will be just releasing uh, information on the trial at that point. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So um, it looks like there's a few more uh, questions in the Q&A pod. I think um, a, a good next question would be, when looking at younger patients, could this potentially be a genetic surgery that parents should plan for, uh, potentially with babies who would be genetically predisposed, <laughs> uh, similar to vaccination for uh, uh, prevention for babies? Yeah, I think that um, those are all, that's a great question. I think, you know, delivering this kind of medicine earlier and earlier might be a goal, um, but I think the, the safety um, evidence um, has to be quite high. Um, and so um, I think we could get there, um, but I'd like to start um, uh, with the, you know, 22 million people in the U.S. who have established ASCVD first. Um, you know, as you know, the, the biggest unmet need that we're trying to fill is the fact that despite all that we have available right now for LDL lowering, um, the sorry statistic is that about half patients one year out from an MI, um, more than half are not on any LDL lowering medication at all. Um, so uh, why is that despite all that we have available? And you know, our thesis is that, that has to do with the chronic care model, where it puts a big burden on patients and providers to have to take a pill every day or take injections every two, two weeks. Um, and that model clearly is broken because people are not, not doing it. Um, and so if we had a one-time therapy that was safe, that was durable, that had this level of LDL lowering, um, I think a lot of patients might sign up for it at the time of an MI or shortly thereafter. So imagine a future where they come in for their MI, they get their stent, and maybe you know a month or two later, they come in for a one-time infusion and then they're done with their LDL care for the rest of their life. So that's where we'd like to start. And then ultimately we can think about uh, trying to take this to much earlier situations. All right. Uh... Thanks so much. This is a fantastic talk. I wanted to end with a broader question, kind of off the top a little bit. I'm curious on your thoughts of the similarities or differences between being a CEO of a company and being a professor in academic medicine. Um, it's it's been a, a great uh, fun to make this change, um, and I, for me, it was a natural extension of the work that we've done um, in terms of trying to understand risk and resistance, and then trying to use that information to develop a new medicine. And I was at a place. Um, where the crit and the, at the time when the CRISPR revolution kind of started in 2012, 2013. And so, um, you know, able to, you know, bring all this together. And um, now I could not have done this, right, in academia. So that was one of the reasons to, to move, right? Um, to give you a sense of like the scope of what is needed, the resources needed to make a new medicine. The company has raised about $800 million over four years. Um, and has spent about 200 million of that uh, to get to where we are now. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that's just not possible, right, within academia. So it kind of had to be done. Now, what I learned in academia over 20 years um, is to pick an important problem and develop a strategy to, uh, you know, try to understand that problem, get the resources, people and money to execute, and then execute. Okay, so that's kind of what I did for 
the problem that I studied was the genetic basis for heart attack for you know 15 years, and um, and so those were the four things that I went out that I had to do. Now it turns out that the the company is very similar. You know, you have a problem, you want to develop this new medicine, and same set of things. You know, pick the problem, um, strategy, raise resources, and then execute. So. Um, um, so there, there's, been, there's been a good number of parallels, uh, but I've also, of course, had to learn a tremendous number of new things along the way as well over the last few years. All right, excellent. That was fantastic. Uh, thanks again. Uh, have a great day. Thanks for giving the talk. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye.